So I'm really grateful to Paul Grant and Ellen Inverso for being with us today to do this presentation. And I'm just going to say a few words about who they are and then turn it over to them. So Paul is on the faculty of the Aaron T. Beck Psychotherapy Research Center at the University of Pennsylvania. And he's a co-developer along with Aaron Beck of recovery-oriented cognitive therapy. And he's conducted a clinical trial to show that it works. He's developed various versions of this therapy to find something that works in everything from prevention and early intervention programs to long-term hospital units. He's also involved in training and writing about this method, and we'll have a book coming out, Recovery-Oriented Cognitive Therapy for Schizophrenia. And Alan is the Director of Clinical Training and Education of the Beck Recovery Training Network, so she's really involved in helping people figure out how to implement the methods we'll be talking about today. In her work, she aims to foster connection and collaboration between staff and those served and help to invigorate the recovery goals of individuals and to make that a priority even in large systems of care. She also values opportunities to connect and work with family members and loved ones who support individuals in their recovery journey. I think, and we're also going to have Francesco, but I don't know anything about her, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll do her intro. This is, this right. is uh, Dr. Francesca Lewis. Good morning, everyone. She is a um, licensed psychologist and um, one of the supervisors on our team. Involved in a lot of our, our implement systems-wide implementation efforts, so. Okay, great. Well, we're glad you all could join us, and... Uh, it's kind of an honor to have uh, such an international crew, everyone all over the, uh, the country as well as uh, spattered across the world. That's kind of neat. Um, and, we, and several people we know. Which is that's cool. right. There's some people who we know. It's yeah. like family. Yeah. Really great. So um, maybe we'll get rolling in terms of uh, getting started. Um, I guess I would say as a sort of a, as, a, as a maybe sort of a starting point, um, this is work that, that I've been working on for about the last almost 20 years now. Um, and originally, um, I began doing this kind of stuff with Aaron Beck, and it was like our, um, our weekend project and our evening project, because we were doing other things. Um, and we just sort of were really interested in, in trying to see if we could think about ways to really help individuals um, <clears throat> with lived experience sort of get more of the life that they want. So we did a lot of interviews, ultimately, early on with people with, uh, with lived experience, as well as their family members and providers and things like that. And a lot of the ideas that, that we'll present have come out of that kind of, of, of collaboration um, between us um, and, and people in the community, as well, as well as people also in hospital settings. So let's see if I can make the, uh, the slides actually move. Oh, there we go. So this is, we just sort of had a few take home points which we think will be uh, useful. Uh, think about, um, the first one is probably the most important one, um, and, and uh, recovery extends to absolutely everybody. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's both extensive people who've gotten a diagnosis and people who don't, but what I really want to focus on is that the far end of the continuum, because we still run into people who will say there are folks who are too sick to really get the life that they want, they, they really no hope for them, and uh, everything that we know shows us that isn't true. Um, and uh, if, if somebody is really stuck in some way, chances are we haven't figured out how to, how to connect up with them, and we'll talk a lot about that. Um, our, I would, should say at the outset, our presentation really does apply across the spectrum, just as as, uh, as was just said. Um, <clears throat> but we will probably focus on the harder end, just because um, that that's a place where we think that uh, there's great room for lots of, uh, of really creative, innovative work. Um, and, and we're really glad to gratify that a lot of people who work on ACT teams and, and know this into the continuum are with us. Um, so. Uh, recovery is actually um, an interesting thing. It's a philosophical kind of position. It, it grew out of um, really uh, the sort of a patient rights movement. Um, it's really kind of, uh, some of it is really harrowing to read about where it comes from. But we've, we've, we've found that it's often really tricky to, to figure out how to do it. Um, and we've developed what we think is some, a nice practical way for everybody to be able to do it um, consistently. And often for people who doesn't come naturally to think about um, and it extends definitely to family members um, and individuals all the way along the way. Um, <clears throat> things should be collaborative. So this, the third point there is about really um, we, we want you, everyone's going to collaborate to help everyone both move up, if you will. Um, but I want to emphasize this concept of really flourishing, because I really think that's, that's what we're going for. We're really thinking that, that people can really, really get the life that they want. 
Um, and in many instances, um, they might end up being happier than we are, and that would be a great outcome. Um, a lot of what we're going to show here, I does, think, doesn't look like traditional treatment, I think, um, and, and we realize that, but we also recognize that if we didn't do it that way, there's a lot of people we would not be able to really reach and, and, and partner with. And we'll try to emphasize that, and maybe if it isn't clear at the end, we'll talk about it. Um, and the framework that we have really does achieve continuity of care. Uh, we've empirically shown that, and towards the end of the, of the, the um, presentation, we will actually show how we've been doing that and how um, the, the same model could follow somebody all the way um, through the levels of care. And really, for many people, they might be able to step out of care completely. I keep thinking I can move the slides on my own. I'm feeling a lack of advocacy here. Um, yeah. All right, great. Hey, Paul, well, I wonder if you could move a little closer to the mic. I think your sound is not coming through really clear. Oh, so everything I just said, I was silent, huh? No, no, you, were, you weren't silent. That. We heard you, but I think you could be a little more clear. Okay, so you, you let me know. So okay. here's, here's a paper that, um, that actually I, I was turned on to by uh, the British researcher Richard Bentall. Um, <clears throat> but I, what I think is really uh, great about this is that it really emphasizes the way in which really um, being connected with other people is really a fundamental uh, human need. Um, and I think it's a, it's a very, it, it's really a cool thing to focus in on because I think much of what we're going to talk about, much of what we've learned um, is through this mechanism. Because a lot of the people that we um, collaborate with, a lot of people we want to work with, a lot of people that we want to um, sort of help promote the life that they want, um, this is something that seems to be really lacking in their life or missing. Um, you know, it's the, it's the person who says, you know, Doc, I'm 52 years old. Where, where is my wife? Where is my work? Where is my house? That kind of thing. So I think for, for a lot of the people, they seem to be closed off from meaningful connections of friends, things of that sort. Um, and in fact, um, in, in some of the facilities we're describe often when we get started on a program, one of the things that's really noticeable is that in the public areas, you have all of these people sitting together and it's really amazingly silent, like they're really sitting together alone. And there's, there's really a, a real strong feeling of disconnection. We have a little theory that's going to that's gonna help lead us along the way. This is a paper that, that we've just um, published in Schizophrenia Research. Uh, it's come online within the last um, month or so. Um, this is really... Um, Beck's cognitive model is our guide in terms of understanding everything. Um, and so I just have the, the bold terms here, the ones that I want to focus on, really the, the cognitive triad, is really really going to guide all of our work. Um, and so essentially, the, whatever, whatever the presentation, um, down underneath it, we're going to see that the person sees themselves as weak, vulnerable, ineffective, and worthless, so some version of that. Um, viewing others as controlling, dangerous, and rejecting. Um, and the future seems uncertain or forbidding. All of these kinds of beliefs um, um, underlie the various manifestations of symptoms we might talk about, or you know, what psychiatrists would call symptoms. Um, but they also are clearly things that could really hold you back from really um, recovering resiliency, the, the kinds of things that you really might want. If, you, if your future just doesn't look like it's worth having, it's going to be very hard for you to do anything. If you really can't trust other people, um, similarly, you're not going to do things with other people. Um, and, and if you really don't feel like you have any capability, you're very likely not to initiate anything um, at all. So, so these these are these are sort of the, the the basic principles that we've got. We've conducted some research to try to, to sort of back up some of our ideas. Um, and actually, what I'm going to show you, I'm going to start off with something that the other people have done uh, based on our work, because a lot of times other people could take your ideas places that uh, you didn't think of taking them yourself. Um, so here's a lovely paper that just came out um, out of UCLA, um, uh, Ready and others. Um, and the main thing here, I think, that really, really kind of pulls everything together is that for about the last, um, you know, 15 or so years, we maybe 10, 15, we've been studying defeatist beliefs. Um, how we got into this is when we interviewed, when we interviewed people and we talked to them. Well, well why don't you? Get, and we don't do it quite as uh, strong as this, but when we tried to figure out why they weren't doing the things they really cared about that they used to like to do, whether it was hiking, sports, whatever, um, they, we, we would find again and again they would say things like, "Well, I." I, I'm, I'm no good, um, I'm, I'm, I'm broken, I can't do these kinds of things. Um, you know, trying, trying, you know, failing a little bit as much as failing clearly. So we, we've done a fair amount of work um, showing that defeatist beliefs are linked to negative symptoms, you know, the, 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 um, the, the lack of activity, the lack of access to motivation, that kind of thing. Um, and then we've also linked them to uh, performance in the community, as well as performance on laboratory tasks. And this, this particular um, paper sh uh, linked up the defeatist beliefs in particular with, with elevated negative symptoms, with, with less effort being put out, and then with 
less good performance on the laboratory tasks. So I think it's, it's a way of kind of wrapping it all together. And with the fetus beliefs being really the, uh, the sort of proximal, the proximal target for, for the, the, the people really not trying and, you know, uh, and not really doing so well on the tasks. Um, <clears throat> and we care about them because we're not so interested in the, in the tasks, the laboratory tasks, as much as we're interested in um, how the, their life is going and be able to get the life that they want. I keep forgetting. This is some cool work um, from Paul Lysaker's group, um, which uh, he's also taken some of our ideas and put them in really super spots. And so what, what I think is really great here is the way he's, he's linking up um, the fetus belief, specific ones about your, um, your, your actual performance, um, and, and how when you lessen those, um, you're able to, to, to function better, but also to, to, to really flourish better at work. And similarly, with more, more global descriptions, um, that's really improving your social functioning. So these, these are key things, I think, that people really want in their lives. And, it, and it's, it's neat to sort of see the way you can have the psychological targets that really are, uh, really are hitting them. So um, I keep forgetting. I, it's very hard to learn new tricks. This is a key thing that I really, uh, this is also from, from Reddy uh, out at UCLA. This idea that you really can show that, that social exclusion and that sense that you don't belong really elevates these kinds of beliefs. And so um, one of the things we're going to talk a lot about is how um, the treatment that really works for people that we've seen is to really help them be, feel included, behaviorally be included, and then to draw conclusions based on what that means. Um, and that's sort of freeing up their recovery process. So I'm finally learning how to do this. Okay. Uh, as, um, as Ron indicated, we, we did conduct a clinical trial to, to, for the perspective that we're going to show uh, Dr. Beck taught me to do this. He said, before you're going to show anybody what it is that you do, you should show them that it works. Um, you know, so that's, that's why this is here. The, the main thing just to say is that, that we, we were able to, um, with this protocol, improve people's daily functioning. That was the closest we could get to recovery. Um, it's got some limitations as to what we did. Um, we also improved motivation and, and positive symptoms in the group, group randomized to the treatment as opposed to those who were getting everything uh, but the treatment. Um, and we recently published this year a paper showing that all of those gains were maintained at follow-up when, when the treatment was no longer being received. So consistent with the idea that people learned things, they changed their perspective and they learned things. Um, and then also the coolest thing that we found is that people who had the longest course of illness were showing improvement by the end. The, so like we have people 30, 40 years, um, they, they, they improved slower, but they improved. Um, and so um, it's really a really... Um, it's, it's really a matter that I think that it's open to anybody. We haven't found anybody who can't show improvement. And if anything, I would say the stuff we're going to show you today is probably like a software upgrade from the stuff we were using in the, uh, in the clinical trial. We've gotten better, I think, at some of the stuff, especially with people, I think, who've, who've really uh, been chronically institutionalized or really uh, um, out, out, of, out of the cycle of recovery for longer than uh, anyone would want to be. Um, this is something also we published this year, but I just want to uh, draw attention to something, the way in which... Um, our perspective is changing about how people get better um, uh, and really get the life they want. And what we really see is uh, that it's, 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 it's as much um, really sort of uh, enhancing access and the availability and strengthening of positive beliefs um, as much as a sort of lowering of the negative beliefs. Um, and so this is a study where, where what we were able to show is that um, we basically randomly assigned people to, to essentially work with somebody collaboratively on a task or to work with somebody not collaboratively on a task, just sort of work side by side with them. Um, and then what we showed is they sh had improved performance um, after the guided success condition, um, but the, the improved the improved performance seemed to really be linked to positive beliefs that, that were strengthened and positive mood. Um, and uh, I have a paper I'm working on now in our clinical trial, which is showing the same thing, that it looks like the improvements that we're seeing uh, really, really go with this it's a real improvement of positive beliefs. So you'll see a lot of emphasis um, I've, I've actually chagrinly been going to conferences these days and been saying, well, you know, when I was in graduate school, they, they invented positive psychology, and I was kind of uh, negative about it and sort of, you know, who knows what I, I looked down my nose at it or something. Now I have to be a positive psychologist because I believe these principles are really the ones that are really leading to the incredible um, successes that we've, we and others are seeing. I think this is a whole open area uh, that really needs a lot more research or how do how the positive beliefs change and how do they really uh, link up to what people really care about, what they really want. So, get at this. Okay, so now what I'd like to do is sort of 
there's a lot, obviously, a lot more we could cover. I just sort of uh, wanted to touch on the, the there's a there's an emerging research base, um, and I've touched on some of it just to give a sense for that we have a we have a conceptualization, uh, in, especially when I emphasize this with negative symptoms, but you'll see something similar to positive symptoms, um, and also with the associated problems, be it self injury or um, or anger and aggression that kind of thing. Um, but what I want to show you now is how we, we really translate that into um, the treatment approach. Um, and, and this is really kind of general. It, it, it will apply to uh, individual treatment. It applies to group. It applies to milieu. Um, it, it works very well on uh, teams, on ACT, IMPACT teams, IMPACT teams. So I, but I want to but I want to emphasize that it's really a way of thinking about how it is that you promote um, recovery and resiliency um, for pretty much anyone. But I, but I want you to think about the idea that we really formulated this initially um, for people that, that were very difficult for family members and practitioners to really reach initially. So thinking of somebody like who's, who's in a state hospital who's got a blanket over their head, somebody who won't get out of bed in the morning. Um, we might be somebody for an ACT team who won't actually let anybody in the door. Um, so this kind of thing. It's one presentation, um, but it's a presentation that, that I think is an important one to think about in terms of how we develop the, this, this approach. But it, it certainly applies to people that don't present that level of, uh, of, of essentially, uh, it, it's not fair to say non-engagement, but they're very, it's very tricky to figure out how to connect to them. So this is, this is, this is the arrow, I think, that, that encompasses the, 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 the treatment. And so I want to take you through it. Um, so, Initially, if you're thinking about somebody like the person who's got the blanket over their head or the person that won't let you in the door, um, the question is, how do you connect with them initially? How do you, how do you find a way to connect with them in some way um, at a human level? Um, and so that's what we think of, we call this access. Now, I have something written here called the adaptive mode. Um, and the, the adaptive mode is a way of thinking about observations that we and others have made over and over again, which is that sometimes um, the, the people can seem really like they're really caught up in stuff, or they might be hard to understand, um, or things like this. They might be listening to things, whatever. But then there are times when they're very different than that, and sometimes it's it's kind of poignant how different that is. Um, and so we think that we think of it as like in terms of Beck's theory of modes, like there's these different modes that people can go into, um, and the adaptive mode is there. It's something that's usually latent in the people. And so what we want to do is figure out how to access it. And uh, my colleagues here are really good at this thing kind of thing, and they'll be able to explain to you all of the ingenuity that you can put into doing that. Um, but this really is kind of a Harry Stack Sullivan kind of thing, where you really, we're really meeting the people where they're at, and we, we know it's a human kind of connection that's really going to make a difference. So we're really going to be connecting with, well, up with them, not over uh, problems, not over illness, not over any of that kind of stuff, but really over the kind of human things that we all do together, um, which, which could, could involve music, doing activities, that kind of thing. We'll, we'll, we'll sort of get to that. But, but the idea is we haven't met anybody yet who we can't, you can't access this mode with. Um, and, and, and often you can get really good and creative at how, how you do it. Um, and, but that's not enough. Right? That's not, it's not enough to access it. What we really want to do is be able to help the, per, the, the person have that mode become, have a little bit more energy in it. Because a lot of the people that we're working with have a hard time really um, accessing motivation to do things. It's very easy for them to give up and not try that kind of thing. Um, so when they're in the adaptive mode, we often find it's much easier for them to access the positive emotions and, and, and their motivation, that kind of thing. So it's about doing stuff with them related to their interests. that You're going to help them to energize that mode of their life, which oftentimes isn't active all that often. We want to get it active more often. So those first two boxes are really you, you access and you energize the adaptive mode through the connection that you have with the person. So that's one of the major recovery principles. So this part of this part of the arrow really shows you shows you how you get a key recovery principle. You, you sort of access and energize the adaptive mode through connection. Again, talking about that important human need, and, and, and by meeting that in, in this this way, you're starting you're starting the person along. You're, you're helping helping to, to, to produce this recovery outcome that matters a lot. But as we often observed, all of these kinds of nice activities don't aren't really what people are looking for completely. They they want that in their life, but they really want something deeper in their life. And that's what the middle box is about. It's, and for a lot of the people that we work with, when they don't have a lot of energy, a lot of access, or they're so concerned about failure, there's a time within the whole context of the, of the approach when you can turn to thinking about the future. Um, and when we think about the future, it's not so much, um, it's not so much a kind of a limited range for the future. It's really a, a, much, a much more powerful view of the future. Um, and maybe the way, way, the way to think about it is it's like it, 
any of you have bucket lists or things like that, that's what we're thinking. So sort of things that really you really want to do that really matter to you, um, that the, the deepest stuff, the stuff that would get you the most excited to talk about, that's what we want here. So this is when we're developing adaptive mode, we're we're really trying to elicit what we would call aspirations. Uh, really, what the what what really sort of something that would sort of pull in motivation, pull in sort of excitement, all of the things that that anyone would would, would have. Um, we use the word aspirations because we found that, um, like a lot of things, the word goals have kind of um, really um, been a bit tainted. And so we find that um, it, we get misunderstood if we come in and we start talking about what are your goals, that kind of thing. We've had people say to us, well, do you want to know what I'm interested in or do you want to know what my treatment thinks, think team thinks I should do or that kind of thing, where they feel an adversarial situation around it. Um, and, and I really think also goals can sometimes seem like they're much more um, proximal. And I think what we really want is we want stuff that's that's much bigger, much broader, um, it's much more exciting. And and again and again, it's going to be things like um, you know I, I want a job, I want I want a girlfriend, boyfriend, um, I, I want to volunteer, make a difference, I want to help animals. Um, a key thing to um, to our perspective is that it's not enough to have the aspiration. You really need to know what it means. You, know, you need to know what, what's the best part of it. Um, because that's something. So, for example, if somebody wants to be a nurse, say that's that's uh, what their what their real um, uh, aspiration is. You can find out what's what's really good about that, um, and probably most times we find this, it's going to be helping people, and or you know making a difference. And that's something that you can do every single day. And if you can get that kind of meaning in, in every in somebody's every single day, you can start to help them shift their perspective in terms of how they can make a difference with other people, how they can pull along with other people, all that stuff. Because being a nurse is a long way off, but helping people's right here, um, and then you can see that you'd be successful in moving towards whatever that whatever you want to you want to go for. Um, this this approach, as you probably could tell, is not particularly um, reflective. It's much more um, an active kind of thing. So it, it's probably not correct to call it a psychotherapy per se or talking therapy because there's some talking. Talking gets where you need it, but it's really about doing, and that's what the actualized box is. Oh, back up step. So that middle box there. That achieves probably one of the most important recovery principles, hope. We worked with a lot of people who didn't think they had a future and they had no hope. Uh, it was really hard. But once you once you see that you have this future and that you can achieve it and get it, that really brings about hope. And and hope does really do some amazing things for people once once it's realized. Okay, and then actualizing, um, that's really doing it. So it's about doing stuff. It's not about thinking you can do it, it's about actually doing it and, and really experiencing um, the, the success of, um, you know, volunteering, of, uh, you know, um, helping other people out in whatever way that is, or, or playing games, whatever whatever the thing is that's that's connected with what matters to you. Uh, so, you know, when I said playing games, what I meant is really like a, a organized sport or something like that, that for a lot of people have a lot of meaning and, and it can be connected up to so many different things like teaching. Um, strengthening, uh, so, so actualizing really is about efficacy, I think. It's really about another recovery principle is really sort of Seeing that you really you really have efficacy, and then the strengthening part is is uh, really two things. One is it's really drawing the conclusions based on your experiences. It's the best way to to, to really develop uh, new perspectives um, based on your experiences. That it's great to do things with other people. That you're capable. That you can make a difference. And these are the kinds of things that really start to propel people forward um, and really into into a life that they want. And then the second part of it is really resiliency. And I think resiliency uh, is easily operationalized as really empowerment. Um, a lot of times people already have the skills, like we all do. It's about bringing them to bear um, when you need them so that you, so that you can continue to do what you want. Because everyone deals with stress. Everyone has different things that happen to them. And you're able to sort of uh, handle the stress. And if something doesn't work out for you, um, then you can sort of learn from that. And that's one of the most powerful things that comes at the end. So, in a nutshell, that's the whole thing. And the strengthened part is where sometimes you're going to get into um, what psychiatrists would talk about as symptoms and things of that sort, sort of dealing with some of the problems that might get in the way. But our idea is that that's where that should come. It should come at a point where the person is already beginning to really do the stuff they want and you can think of some of the challenges that they've historically had as, um, as obstacles that they can, uh, can work with. Um, and if they need to, if it's getting in the way. So I think I've talked an awful lot. Um, maybe this is the this is the final way. Um, there should be quotes around the patient mode. So um, one of the ways we try to understand the observations that we've made, and we'll elaborate on this a little bit, is that 
um, oftentimes, a lot of people that we work with, they're in what we're going to call in quotes a patient mode, which is just a mode that's dominated by, by what a psychiatrist calls symptoms, and um, they might be really withdrawn, or they might be in a position where they're, where they're, where they, uh, where they're acting out more, um, there might be some self-injury, involved, whatever, whatever, whatever it is, um, or they're really trying to be a really good patient, um, so they're taking their medications, they're doing everything to try to be a really good patient, but that doesn't mean they're really, really getting what they want, they're, they're kind of afraid not to, to, to lose more. So we like to contrast that with this adaptive mode, which we can access um, pretty much with every every contact, and then watch grow over time. And that's what the arrow is trying to illustrate. So now we want to talk a bit about how it is that we actually do all of this. Uh, these pieces that Paul was just talking about. And so what I want to introduce you guys to this is a recovery map. And the recovery map is a tool that we use that uh, is our way of kind of, uh, it's a conceptualization. It's how do we understand um, a person. And I want to be really, really clear about something. This is not a tool that we use, um, you know, sitting with a person and talking through all the different kind of pieces of themselves. This is really just a... Uh, an organizational tool for um, maybe it would be used a lot in uh, work with teams where many, uh, like in ACT teams where different in, uh, staff members are going to be having contact with uh, individuals or families throughout the course of a week uh, as a way to communicate with each other, also as a way for treatment teams to help kind of organize um, ideas and also figure out what are the pieces uh, that we don't know yet. Are there things... Um, uh, how do we understand when a person is both at their best and also when, how do we understand when a person is having um, a more difficult time uh, getting to that life that they want or doing the things that are important to them. And so it kind of fits in this. Um, and as you can see, it really breaks down uh, into the different components of the therapy that Paul just talked about. So um, activating the adaptive mode, what are the things that a person really likes and enjoys, get them excited, and when they're doing that, where is the, what are the potential beliefs that can be activated um, in that mode? What does it say about them when they're doing these things that they really care about? And we're going to go into that next. Then finally, you know, what are the asp or next, what are the aspirations? Do we know them? I think that's actually one of the spots where um, we end up spending a lot of time uh, with um, the folks that we, we work with. Um, in really learning more than just, you know, I want to get out of the hospital or I want to, um, you know, uh, go to groups. What, what do you really want? And, and figuring out what that would mean about the person. Uh, what are the things that might get in the way? And then based on that, how can we start to, to generate that meaning of the aspirations right here, right now into some positive action? So this is just kind of an um, outline of So the first step is really about activating that uh, adaptive mode, and the first step, as Paul said, is access. So one of the questions that I really like to think about with this is, when is it that any of us are at our best? The things that make any of us happy. So usually when we're doing this in a presentation, I kind of call out, so I'm going to encourage people who are feeling so inclined to feel free to use the chat box to answer this a little bit for yourselves as well, for yourself or the people that you care about. But when we think about activating the adaptive mode, we want to think about when is it that we are at our best. It's usually when we're doing things, when we're connected to other people, when we're doing the things that we enjoy that make us feel really happy. So I want to encourage you, you know, what, what makes you happy? Dancing, laughing with family and friends, rock climbing. This is fantastic. I love it. <laughs> um, I'm always dancing. I don't know if anyone noticed when Paul's talking, I'm like trying to control my shoulders. Um, <laughs> so um, singing, cooking, time with daughters, awesome. photography. Beautiful. You guys rock. Playing Scrabble. Don't get into a Scrabble game with like my husband and his family. I don't enjoy it. They're way too into it, <laughs> but they like it, and that's how they connect. Swimming, playing with dogs. Pets are huge. Pets are huge. Talking about animals. Um, anyway, so it's when we're doing these things when we're connected to other people. They're the things that we have interest in. So we see this a lot in events um, like birthday parties, um, uh, during sports, sporting events, right? Um, uh, the, the word play is there. There was a, a place where we worked where the whole unit put on a play and people were really excited about their roles in the play and, and the, the sets they were creating. Whatever it is that a person is interested in are the things that really activate us. Um, we're doing these things we really care about. I can't remember, I'm trying to look and see if anyone said cooking, but uh, um, 
I know one of the, the, the things that oftentimes people will, will, will share is when they're, you know, in the kitchen or making things for other people and sailing. Oh, this is great. Uh, I know that the, the when this is a YouTube video, the chat is not going to be <laughs> a part of it. So hopefully I've shared several of the, the things, but I think that's fantastic. But these are when um, these are not things that we enjoy just because we're all people who are uh, watching this webinar. They're things that just people enjoy in general. And they're when we feel, um, uh, like I said, most connected. We have energy. We're excited to share it with other people. Um, it's when we feel like we're at our best. And when we're doing that, what is it that we see people uh, you know, expressing humor, the things that they know a lot about, areas of skill that we might not have realized. Once we've accessed and found out something people are interested in or really know about, it brings about this sense of like, uh, uh, you know, I know what I'm talking about. You got to, you know, what I have to say is important. So it gives people uh, a really uh, nice time to share their knowledge. Um, we've got energy and we're able to really talk and have a really great dialogue. So. In saying all this, I really want to echo an important point that Paul already mentioned earlier, which is that um, these are um, these are things that can be accessed in anyone, um, even folks who have really. If you think about yourself, um, kind of on your worst day, <laughs> um, or when you're really feeling crummy, or you don't, you're, you know, the idea of in connecting and interacting with other people just feels like a lot of work or energy. There's usually something, and I'm guessing that's a lot of the things that people listed out, um, that if it's brought into your space, your favorite song um, that you can't help but dance to, or someone comes in and they're asking you about that game that you really like or that sport that you really like or that team, there's something about it that you just, it, it really brings out that um, energy and uh, it just really, um, it's a hook. It's a hook. So... <clears throat> The way that we've um, been able to access it, there's a couple different ways. One of them is, so we all, there are several things that we all just kind of listed out that we probably all have in common. Uh, I know I connected with uh, the person who, who mentioned dancing and, and, and pets. But so sharing interests, and this is one thing when we're working with um, uh, staff, um, it's really about what are the things that, we, these are things we like because we're people, not because uh, any of us has maybe a particular uh, diagnosis or not. So we have a lot of things to share. Let's let's share those together. Let's talk about them or let's do things related to them together. Um, for example, listening to music. For folks who really have a uh, difficult time um, uh, maybe even putting their feet on the floor in the morning, sometimes it's about meeting them where they're at, going, you know, joining them in the space and playing a song and saying, hey, what do you think of this one or should I try something else? Um, we want to be able to hit, um, you know, where, whatever the person needs at that moment. Um, so here's just a few examples of, you know, sharing food, music, sports, again, all those things we just had, uh, I'll list it out um, a few moments ago. Another really great way to help access the adaptive mode is to um, ask individuals for advice. How... I think one of the most um, energizing, and empowering, and, and meaningful experiences for most of the folks that we work with is um, moving out of that role of needing help or being helped um, all the time, um, but rather being in a role of helping other people. And uh, again, it can tap into those areas of knowledge or skill and uh, be a way to um, uh, bring someone into a, a maybe more uh, interactive or social situation with a lot less pressure. So, for example, um, asking for options on choices. I, I, for the cooks out there, like I don't cook uh, much, uh, if at all. And so, I might say to somebody, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm really thinking about so I'm wanting to try and make something for for my family. I really don't know much. What do you think I should try to make? Um, should I should I do uh, like a salad -y thing? Should I do like a beef thing? I might want to present some options because if I, especially if I'm working with somebody who's got a lot uh, of hard time kind of generating energy on their own um, and might be really uh, not really interested in talking much if at all, uh, I want to make it uh, present something that's going to take as little energy but as most connection as possible. So asking for advice. 
or um, even bringing something into the space and asking for opinions. A lot of times I will ask for opinions on uh, my nail color. What do you think I should do next? Um, you know, if you like this, what should I do next? I'd show you mine now, but they don't have anything on them. Um, so, um, uh, and ask you for how to, how to do certain things. I'm about to run a group, and uh, we want to do something kind of fun at the beginning. Should I do cards, or should we play music? Which song, song should I play? Um, again, those are kind of examples for um, folks who are really disengaged and are having a difficult time connecting with others, um, whether that's at home or on a unit. Um, uh, we have, I know that there's an individual who, uh, uh, living in his family home, really had uh, success in finding a role in his family with helping with them with their technology because that was the thing that he was good at uh, and they didn't know how to do it. So really tapping into those areas. And this is definitely, I think, an area where we say, you know, the, sometimes the best therapy doesn't look like therapy because these are really fun things. They're, they're things that are just kind of tap into us as humans. Um, but what does it say about us when we, uh, or what could it say about us when we're uh, helping out our family member or a staff member? What does it say about us when we're sharing things uh, with other people, right, that I'm connected, that I'm capable? Um, so really the beliefs, that put those positive beliefs have the potential to be, be developed really early on. The other important thing about this stage is that this is something that as kind of you're moving along and, and, and working with people on things and trying to go out and, and do stuff, when roadblocks of low energy or disconnection come up, we can always come back to it. This isn't a linear process. So this is kind of always going to be your foundational step. Anything you so then uh, the next piece is really about energizing that adaptive mode. And energizing is, uh, again, it's about um, having a positive experience one time is not going to be really sufficient for kind of generating this greater change. So when we energize, we want this adaptive mode to be present more often. We don't want it to be the exception to the rule, um, though that is sometimes one of the ways we do. I just realized I didn't mention this. It's one of the ways we sometimes um, We'll try and find out what are the things that other people like, because just asking folks, you know, what do you like? What do you want to do? Uh, gets us a whole lot of nothing. Um, uh, you know, nothing. I don't like anything anymore, and so on. So one of the things we might say is uh, to um, maybe a parent or to, to staff, um, when is this person at their best? Or, or what are the exceptions to the rule? So you, you're not really seeing a lot. Of it, every time except when are, do we see this? So anyway, we want that thing, this to not be the exception so much anymore and really be um, incorporated more and more into um, what the person does. And so energizing the adaptive mode is about um, really generating opportunities for these uh, interests and activities to occur more often um, and generate enough energy so that the person is able to start thinking about the future. It's a place where... Um, uh, it's a place where we have uh, the opportunity to access kind of motivation um, and energy. When someone is feeling more, uh, when someone is feeling more energized and is able to really start thinking about the things that they like, we have an opportunity to start thinking about the things that they want. So this is that next key piece, which is identify, which is the aspirations. What are the aspirations of the individual? And the first piece of that is really identifying the aspirations. What is it that a person uh, wants to be doing and getting, and who do they want to be doing these things with? And again, encouraging people to really think big about what it is that they want. Um, so when we're talking about identifying aspirations, it's about, uh, again, asking the individual what they want. Um, but also uh, really encouraging them to take a lot of time to enrich that and use a lot of imagery to just imagine if, every, if things were exactly how you would want it to be, what would it look like? Uh, what would it be like? Uh, and have them really paint you a really vivid picture. And as Paul had mentioned before, that it's, it, it may be something that's particularly far off. Um, maybe it is something that uh, it would be far off for anybody. I mean, it could be, uh, uh, I want to, um, I don't know, uh, be a famous rock star. I want to, um, or maybe it's just 
Well, it can be anything. I have a hard time coming up with kind of the, the things that are out there because nothing really is. Um, because the most important part when we have someone imagine what it's going to be like is to really get to the sense of the meaning. And what is it about this that would be so good about having? What, what, would, it, uh, what would be the best part about it? What would it mean to be able to achieve this? And um, the meaning uh, is the thing that we're going to be be aiming toward. Maybe that, that, you know, becoming a nurse, getting married, having kids, uh, you know, traveling uh, to Mars, whatever it might be, um, is, is going to be really important and at the top, but the pieces that uh, are underlying that are what we can work towards now. What about the example? Sure. Um, yeah, a really good way to illustrate this would be, so we have a young woman who we've been working with for a while who has a um, she's had a lot. She's had a lot of um, challenges in moving forward in her recovery. Um, some of them, including some pretty significant self injury, um, and uh, she is somebody who, when we asked her, what is it that she would be would want to be having and doing when all this is said and done? She's in a, 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 a facility where she's receiving treatment. Um, what would your life look like? What would you be having? What would you be getting? And she talked about two things in particular. Uh, one is being a nurse, and the other is that she wants to uh, get married and, and have a, a really great husband. And so we started talking about, um, instead of going into kind of the steps of how we would get there right away, uh, which can oftentimes be a place where people kind of doubt and that feeling of, well, I can't do those things anymore, or I'm not really interested, that can really come up when we start to plan out these things. What instead we did is we took the time to think about what would this be like, paint me a picture, describe it to me. And what she described was um, that if she, when she's a nurse, she would uh, be a nurse who works with kids who've experienced some significant trauma, um, not too unlike her, uh, and that she would be someone she could see herself walking down kind of the, the hallways of the hospital and uh, talking with kids and finding a way to, and talking with them about how they can have hope and how they can uh, overcome all of these pieces and then it would make her feel really proud and that it would make her feel really uh, important like she has something to offer um, and uh, the other people would see her as somebody who is really helpful and important. So those are some really important meanings to that that came out of kind of just envisioning what that might look like. But the the best one was when she was talking about, we talked about what would be the best part of having a, uh, a husband. What would you do? What would it look like? Kind of take me through a day. And she described um, how they would be walking together, holding hands along the water and going and getting ice cream and, and, and a cup of coffee and just kind of really just being together and, and enjoying each other's company. And when I asked her, when we were talking about it, you could see her entire affect kind of shift, right? Brightens up more relaxed, and when I asked her what would it feel like um, to, to have that, she said she'd feel uh, loved and worthy and hopeful. Um, a lot of things that have come up as being, um, uh, you know, uh, come up, that really counter how she had seen herself in some of her more challenging times. But um, she also talked about how uh, other people might see her too in that, that she has accomplished something, that she's not just this person who has uh, had all these troubles, um, but that she's really able to, to do it. So those, those beliefs about her um, efficacy uh, and her motivation to get it really grew just in imagining what that future would look like. And the next piece is then uh, related to actualizing the adaptive mode, <clears throat> excuse me, um, which is called positive action. It's how, what are the things that we are doing every day to start achieving the meaning of the things that uh, are important to us. And this can involve um, just participating in different things in the broader community. So um, uh, going to church, uh, cooking for your family. We have an individual who used to, um, uh, and when he was uh, an adolescent and, 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 and young man, he would uh, go perform um, at different jazz clubs with uh, his brother and some friends uh, in the city. And uh, after a quite an extended period of hospitalization, he started to really get back in the flow of um, 
uh, first started with kind of listening to the jazz music again and then teaching other people about it, um, starting to play again, and ultimately did um, perform at some uh, open mic events, just ways of kind of re, um, realizing the, the things that have been really important. Um, this also could involve having a meaningful role. I had mentioned uh, how we all have roles in our different, uh, you know, our, our maybe our families, or there's of, uh, oftentimes opportunities to have a meaningful role where maybe I'm helpful, I'm contributing, I'm uh, 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 just doing different things as part of a milieu. So it's really kind of across the, the different types of um, situations that a person might be in where we can have a role and generate a lot of, you know, uh, uh, more positive beliefs about ourselves and our abilities. <clears throat> In doing all those things, we actually start to really connect to other people, um, and, and it's really about broadening kind of the scope of it. it. We don't, like I said at the beginning, we don't do these things because, uh, you know, we have a particular diagnosis or experience. We do them because we're people who, who enjoy things and want things in our life, and so that means that uh, it gives us an opportunity by participating in the broader community or having a meaningful role. We're connecting to maybe other people in a way that we haven't in a while, um, so it's not just a... a, a connecting with my treatment team or my team of community providers, um, but also broadening into other relationships and friendships, uh, reconnecting within my family as just some examples of ways in which that happens. And then as each step, uh, each step and each thing that we do is then uh, connected to the thing that we want. So uh, it's by drawing people's attention to the fact of everything I do is gonna be in service of this greater aspiration. And then we want to strengthen this. So it's really about drawing people's attention to what does it say about you that you are able to do all of these things. Um, this is how we uh, either learn new uh, beliefs about ourselves that we may not have held before, or it helps us to reaccess some of those beliefs that we used to have when uh, we were on a, you know, a trajectory toward the life we wanted, maybe before some of the obstacles came about. So it's really about um, asking some really uh, kind of um, casual questions to get the individual to um, draw their attention to the fact that I am actually able to connect to other people, um, that maybe I can have more control uh, than I realize, that I am capable, and that I'm able to actually generate some of my own energy. Um, so for example, uh, if I feel like I have to lay in bed and just wait until I have the energy before I can start moving toward the life that I want, um, when we're listening to music or we are, uh, you know, looking at what color I should be painting my nails and we feel more energized and you kind of see that being brighter, it's like, wow, you know, um, what do you think about that? It seems like, you know, we thought we weren't going to be able to have energy, um, but by when we were doing this, it seemed like you felt more energized. I know I feel more energized. What do you think? Should we do it more often? And what does that say about your ability to, to create your own energy? So it's really about um, drawing new conclusions um, that help to uh, a person change their perspective on themselves. Yeah, I would say that this is this is a really important part of what we're doing because for a lot of the people, they won't spontaneously always draw the conclusion. Some people will, but a lot of the people that are working with, one of the reasons they might have gotten a little bit stuck or not really getting the life that they so much want is that they might not have they might not have these these things as active. And so this is really where you you, you empower the person in a way to really strengthen these kinds of beliefs and, and open up possibility for them. And, uh, and what we've seen is, is people go from really being so withdrawn to, to having all of these um, abilities that you would never guess that they have. Who knew that this, this gentleman who didn't talk to anyone could teach people how to moonwalk or that kind of thing. So there's all kinds of things that come out of this. But, but the key, key reason why it's here is it doesn't, won't spontaneously happen. Having the experience isn't sufficient necessarily to really help the person really make their big progress. Ah, so that was my cue anyway. So there we go. I'm always buddy in when I shouldn't. So this is this is our way of thinking about about the way the way the treatment works. Um, and really, it's about it's about it really strengthening the positive beliefs. You know, the person goes from uh, he used to think I was a hurting person, but now I know I'm a helping person. I'm a helping person, not a hurting person. Um, the negative beliefs are weakened. What whatever those are, they they have less access to them. And then, you know, resiliency is really being able to handle stress, being able to handle difficult situations, and things like that. And that's where you might address. Um, Things the psychiatrists would call hallucinations, delusions, disorganization, um, and we've been really dealing with uh, some of the, the, the sort of things that, that contribute to poor community function. You're just not getting the life you want already. Um, this is another way to think of the way the treatment works. Um, initially, like we said, there's sort of an accessing um, at period to it. 
Um, and then there's a lot of mastery experiences. We've uh, been inspired not to use mastery, so I want to use empowerment instead. Um, but you get the idea. Whatever, whatever, whatever the challenges are, being able to, because really what, that, what the power is about is not, not allowing any of those things to get in the way of the life that you really want and these things that are really going to matter to you um, and that you might not have thought you could get. Um, and really, really at the end of the day, um, it's really the participation with others and it's meaningful participation with others, it's not idle. That really is at the core, I think, of what really produces uh, some of the most powerful recovery outcomes that we've seen. I um, wanted to transition just a little bit to show you sort of, we, we've been able to implement this in a, in a, in a large, um, couple of large systems um, in the United States. Um, and so this is one way of looking at, at the way the, uh, the system works in terms of where the people are. A lot of times they're in very restrictive levels of care, uh, like state hospital or jail. But there, there are all of these levels of less and less restrictive care as you go down through the figure. Um, and one of the things we've been able to do is to be able to actually work with staff in all of these places to collaborate with the individuals to really help them get the life that they want as they step through these levels of care um, and, and the, the nature of the care changes. So um, this is a quote from Philadelphia, um, the chief medical officer who we've collaborated with here. And actually, if any of you know Arthur Evans, he's actually the one that helped us get started in a lot of this work. Um, really, really, really creating a true network of care um, that promotes continuity of care for people who, who if, as he says here, historically uh, often languished in institutions. Uh, we're sad to say, but we know we're not unique that way. But we've really been able to see people go from really being very, um, very out of the community to be very much active members, getting back to church, back to their family, um, starting to, to make art again and show it, all that kind of stuff. Um, so these are just some of the, the there are a lot of teamwork that we do, different kinds of teams. Um, that we work with. Uh, we've worked with a lot of ACT teams. Um, it, it also sort of supports individual therapy. Um, this, is a, this is a slide that I really like, and then I think I want to hand this over to Francesca. Um, but but this, this, this particular slide illustrates the simplicity in some ways of what continuity of care means. So this is, the, this is, a, this is a garden, but the gentleman who created this initially, um, when, we were, uh, when we were the staff were connecting up with him, realized he had a long history, a lot of challenges. Um, and uh, but he was a really great gardener, um, and so and what really was a hook for him with gardening is not just doing the gardening, but teaching other people how to do it. So teaching other people's staff and individuals on the unit. So they created a beautiful garden, and he was doing fabulously uh, in lots of different ways, being empowered relative to some of his challenges. Um, and then he transferred to the community, um, and this is the garden as he was uh, directing it in the community. So you can take the exact same idea. And gardening isn't the kind of thing that's confined to if you have some kind of problem or so. There's lots of opportunities in the community, so it naturally leads to some of the ways in which you can participate in the community more largely in terms of some of the community gardens that are right around um, the residents. But I'm going to hand it off to Francesca. She's going to tell you a little bit more about this kind of stuff. A little bit of musical chairs. I uh, just want to say good afternoon. Um, not in the picture. Oh. Um, wanted to say good afternoon, uh, good morning, and evening for folks who are in different time zones. Um, I was going to talk a little bit today about applying this model to residential programs. We do a lot of our work in longer term settings in residential programs, and so we wanted to talk a little bit about that because, as Paul mentioned a little bit earlier, um, it's not uncommon for some of these sites to have a very quiet milieu, um, to walk on the unit, for it to be very quiet, for there to be a big group of people together, um, but maybe alone at the same time. And that's often one of the first, one of the things we really want to focus on is making this environment active. We want to infuse it with energy. We want it to be active. We want to infuse it with hope, with a sense of empowerment. Um, and so we've really found that, that we can do that um, by targeting the three areas that you guys see on the screen there. We really try to encourage all of the residents or the longer term programs that we're working at to think about developing a really active milieu through the use of clubs. Um, these clubs should really be things that are seeped in the individual's interests. Um, it should be done in collaboration with individuals, uh, things that are passions of theirs, are are things that they find interesting, are areas of strength um, that they have. And we found that, that through this, um, residents can really create a very active milieu that, that provides a lot of opportunity for um, activation of the adaptive mode and also a lot of opportunities for people to learn new lessons and draw new conclusions about themselves. And again, they're steeped in the things that the residents find 
to be important and interesting. Um, some of the sites that we've been at, it's incredible to see the creativity. Some of the sites that we've been at have created walking clubs, um, and it's amazing to see the creativity that people can use. Um, people have created walking clubs on loft units. Um, people have created walking clubs that go out into the community. Uh, people create coffee and music clubs, open art studios. Um, we've seen things about performances. There's some drama clubs. So it can really create a very active environment for people. We also really want to try and infuse the treatment teams uh, with a sense of hope and a sense of empowerment for the individuals. Um, we're trying to encourage that treatment teams move away from a problem focus to more of a future-oriented, strength-based focus. So really trying to connect with and collaborate with individuals on their interests, their passions, and really focusing on, as Ellen was talking about, those meaningful aspirations and thinking about ways that those meaningful aspirations don't have to be something that happens 10 years down the road, 15 years down the road, but that there can actually be steps that people are taking to meeting those aspirations, to meeting those meanings um, that very day. And so that's really one of our hopes with the treatment teams. And community outings, um, with community outings, we're really encouraging sites to think again about connecting people to things that are meaningful for them in the community. Um, we found that these can really be uh, an incredible source of energy, an incredible source of help, uh, hope for people. Um, and really, it's been amazing. In some situations, we've seen individuals be able to connect to things in the community while they're in a residence. And then when they step down to a lower level of care, they're able to stay connected with that community resource. Uh, and that can just be so meaningful, and it can really help smooth that transition into a different setting for individuals if they can stay connected to that. So I want to talk a little bit about one of the examples of uh, one of the clubs uh, that occurred. This was an animal donation drive club. It's a little bit hard to throw a club on the end of that. <laughs> um, but this was an idea that was really generated by individuals. Um, it was a milieu that had a lot of individuals on it who had either been animal owners, were animal owners, loved animals, wanted to contribute, wanted to be able to give back in some way. And based on all of those mutual interests, um, the milieu came up with the idea of actually creating a, a donation drive. And so they ended up... It's a lot to this is a locked unit, which was really impressive when you think about the creativity that it took. But they ended up um, creating a drive uh, and asking uh, people to donate. They ended up getting numerous donations, and then a number of the individuals were able to take the donations to a local um, animal shelter and actually drop the donations off uh, and be a part of that process. Who's the picture illustrated? So the pictures were actually created by the individuals. One of the things that I really loved about this club is that it provided an opportunity for just a bunch of different roles. Um, it provided an opportunity for a bunch of, for people's strengths and many unique strengths to really come out. Uh, you know, for some people, they really cared about the animals. It was really about uh, taking care of animals. But for other people, it was about being able to show their creativity through creating some of the signs that you see. For other people, uh, it was about reaching out to people and asking for donations. So it really it provided an opportunity for a lot of people to connect in many different ways around the same project. Um, and it was interesting, too, because it, it ended up connecting to what a lot of people were interested in uh, after they left this facility. A lot of people were interested in the idea of volunteering uh, or of being a pet owner someday. Um, or taking care of, maybe not an animal, but taking care of something or someone in their future. Um, and again, what kind of conclusions can you draw about yourself if you're able to have this successful experience um, on the unit before you get discharged? That was just an example. One of the things that we do think a lot about when we are doing our work is this idea of um, culture change. Sometimes, especially when we are coming onto units that are maybe very quiet, uh, that don't have a lot of activity, it really does require 
a shift in some cultural beliefs uh, about what treatment looks like. Like we said earlier, a lot of this treatment, the really good treatment, doesn't end up looking like treatment. And thinking about ways to get everyone involved, um, from directors down to uh, the maintenance staff, bought in and sort of on board with this idea and with this philosophy. So we do spend a lot of time really thinking about how to impact culture change. Um, some, of the, some of the thoughts that we really have um, is we found that it can be really helpful to connect to the common values uh, that the staff have for starting to work at a facility like this. Um, everywhere we go, we find that staff work at these places because they care. They care a lot about individuals. They care a lot about wanting individuals to get better and to have fulfilling lives. And to really tap into what those aspirations are that, that staff themselves have for the individuals they work with, for the environment of the facility that they work at, and for their own uh, work environment as well can really be a helpful way to start that conversation about culture shift. Um, we've also found that just as we want to shift away in treatment from focusing on problems, that oftentimes we want to really encourage staff to focus, to shift their focus away from maybe problems or challenges and really think about individual strengths, uh, things that individuals are passionate about, times that, like Ellen said, they've really seen individuals at their best, and to really focus on that and think about cultivating that in the environment. Um, and we really want, when we are thinking about challenges, to try and conceptualize them in the larger picture of an individual's hopes and aspirations. Um, we found that when it comes to culture change, it's really important to be communicating and noticing those positive impacts that staff can have when they are focused on individual strengths and their passions. And to really draw their attention to those successes as well, because we found just as sometimes it's hard for individuals to recognize successful moments that they've had, it can be hard for staff as well, and to really draw people's attention. Uh, to their efficacy, to the things that they've done well can be really helpful. And of course, getting it in documentation. That always matters. I think Paul's going to talk a little bit about some outcomes. While we're doing the, the shift in seats, I know we're going to do questions shortly, but the group versus club question I just wanted to hit real quick um, from Deborah, which is, uh, yeah, I, it's not just about changing it to positive language, but if we think about um, a club versus a group, a lot of our folks get kind of grouped to, to death <laughs> or have been a part of the same groups over and over and over again. And so a club is um, something that you really want to belong to, right? We all are maybe a part of a social club or do events or have things in our lives that we might be involved in. And so uh, it's about um, not just changing a name, but also changing the concept of what is it that you do when you're together with, with people? What really want, what is it that you want when you're bringing people together? Yeah, and, and we've, we've really seen um, people who really wouldn't want to go to group um, really love the club um, and really love what, what, it, what it stands for. And, and there's kind of an ownership there because club is something you're a member of. So I'm breaking the rule that I said back to you. told me because here's some outcomes. Um, we just wanted to show um, we've, been, we've been doing this, this work um, in a few states and we're actually expanding into more states now. Um, but it's just to, to show you that, that this kind of implementation actually can Two things, really. This is, this is outcomes in a, in a large uh, state in which we had people who were the typical providers in state hospital, on ACT teams, um, and in community behavioral health. Um, and, and they were working with people who um, were some of them uh, who had mostly a diagnosis of serious mental illness, but were selected because they, they seemed to be stuck in some way. They weren't really getting the recovery they wanted. In many cases, that was for decades, um, especially for some of the people in the hospital. Um, and what, what I want to say here is that recovery is, is measurable. It's quite measurable. It's, it's not an abstract concept. And so what we showed here is that over the course of the six months of, of, um, of the implementation, of our supervising the implementation of recovery and cognitive therapy, two-thirds of the people made a very significant improvement uh, in at least one of the SAMHSA recovery dimensions. Um, and, and I think it's, it's, re it's really quite, um, it's really typical providers, most challenging individuals, progress. So we think there's a lot of, um, a lot of possibility 
um, for, for this kind of approach to really make a big difference across the spectrum, but especially for people who have historically not really been able to get the lives that they wanted and often have settled for or just thought they never could. Um, and this is, this is really outcomes like getting back to school, um, dating, volunteering, all the, the meaningful stuff, getting your own place um, and, and handling everything, all of that kind of stuff. Um, similarly, um, we, we've had we have program in Philadelphia where we've been we've been actually involved in forensic settings with people who are sort of stuck in the forensic system, um, and and collaborating with programs there to really help the people get out of the facility and really be able to participate in the community in the way that they want to, and not get stuck in that first place where they land, nor go back into the criminal justice system. So I might uh, we might uh, we might stop there. Um, there's obviously lots more we could talk about. There's a lot of people that helped us. We could easily fill uh, many, many, many slides. These are a few of the, of the people that were at that really sort of helped make sure that we could do some of this work. We know okay. that there were questions that were asked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to switch the format here a little bit. Uh, one thing somebody asked is whether the PowerPoint slides you used, whether it would be okay for me to send those out so that people have the slides. Um, yeah, I would say the main thing that we, we usually ask is that uh, that they don't get distributed far and wide kind of thing, um, but but we're happy for, if they're useful for people, for them to use them, but not, okay, to so sort of, not to put them on Facebook or something so that 300 million people right. get them. I'll send it with that request that they not post them publicly, but I'll just send it to those who registered. Yeah, yeah, okay. that's, no, no, it's, um, and also, um, I guess I would say, if there's any feedback from anybody about about how if there's slides that are unclear or things that you think would be great to have in slides, we're also open to that too. Uh, if you want to get, uh, right. get better. Okay. So um, also, um, I have a question before we really get started. Like, did you say much about how this might be adapted specifically for early intervention? I know you've done some work with that. Um, yeah, so so in early intervention, we've actually um, we've actually worked on uh, uh, early intervention teams as a part of the, you know, the sort of SAMHSA grants that have, uh, are part of the RAISE project. Um, and what I would say is that um, this particular model, I think, really fits people at that point because typically they they don't really want to have an illness, they don't want to have a problem, um, they 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 want this how it's always confusing. They want to they want to. And so it's very easy to, um, to, to meet them at that place with this model because this model isn't emphasizing illness. This model isn't emphasizing uh, medications. It isn't, it isn't emphasizing diagnosis and things of that sort. Um, and I think we've, we've had particular success with this model working with people who are at, at, that, at that place um, in late adolescence or early 20s because it's very easy to talk to them about their tennis shoes that they're really into, the, the team that they're interested in, that kind of thing. Um, and, and have the talents kind of really flow out from there um, and, and then to begin to, to sort of contextualize any of the things that sort of ended them up here uh, in terms of uh, in terms of this what they want to be getting what they want to be doing um, and so then there's a reason to come to the session because you're actually moving towards some of the stuff that you want to do um, and a lot of times I think it feels to them like they're not getting a chance to do a lot of that um, and I was I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago where they were presenting the successes um, from from an early intervention service, and it looked to me like they were really succeeding when the person thought they should take medication and that kind of thing. Um, and I think this model is just a little broader than that because it doesn't require that. Um, medications are one of the tools that you can use, but it doesn't require that in order to get going and, and, and do stuff. And so I think it broadens the, the, the impact those kinds of services can have. Um, and we, like I said, we, again, we've, seen, we've had pe people who are parents and, and family members say, We've seen things in our relative that we never knew. We've, we'd given up on. We didn't really, I mean, at the prom. Look at that, that beautiful prom picture, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. So I don't know if you want to elaborate a little bit more than that. But. Yeah. No, I think that's, I think the focus on um, hitting the aspirations early and really connecting on interests are, are some of the most um, important things with that particular group. Yeah, it was, he was talking, I was thinking of a, an incredible young woman who we did. We got the, the prom picture, the picture of her, you know, with the, uh, getting her uh, driver's license, and, but it was because um, uh, the idea of focusing on these things that were really scary um, and just really focusing on what that meant about her was actually quite um, problematic. It, it really tapped into, you know, am I going to be able to achieve the things I want? And instead, we, uh, we focused on actually starting to achieve those and um, 
and in doing so, it, it, it helped those, those helped with the symptoms that she did have actually by really continuing to engage in life and, and, and maintain uh, connections with people who she was really started really feeling like inclined to pull away from uh, out of fear of not being understood. And so I think that it really helps to counter those, um, those pieces. Right. And I also think it's, I also think it's very helpful for the family. Um, because one of the perspectives that family can have is they don't need to be as much the care providers um, as to get back to doing what families do well and really doing some of those, you know, those adaptive mode-like things that, that really bring out the best in everybody. Um, and, and also there's a, there's a bit of a framework for understanding some of the confusing things that come up in, in a, in a sort of non-stigmatizing um, and really sort of uh, uh, empowering way. Right. So Judy was asking, she said, it, Sounds like improvement in individuals with more severe and longer illness requires more time. And do you see more time as a crucial variable for the success of these individuals? I would say more time, or perhaps, um, uh, shall we say, maybe a, a more more intensive uh, approach. Um, one of the things I would say that, it, that an advantage that an ACT team has is that they have multiple people to come out and make contacts. Um, one of the sad things we see in a lot of ACT teams is that it looks like people stay on their census for a very long time. But I don't think that's the way the model was originally designed. And, and you, you, you really have a lot of people out there hitting these sorts of things every single week. You can see some amazing progress. Um, what I would say is in weekly individual therapy, what we saw is that, yeah, it's going to take longer um, if you continue with weekly individual therapy. But, it, but if it's uh, in some of these settings we've been talking about, they're richer than individual therapy. So that's fantastic. Yeah. And Charlie says the adaptive mode model is a great positive psychology model that seems to match a lot of behavioral cognitive principles. And he'd like to hear more about staging or prioritizing treatment goals such as behavioral and environmental barriers versus unhelpful thoughts and beliefs and how to make such decisions. Okay. She could elaborate um, just in terms of what he means in terms of behavioral barriers. Um, so well, I think I, I, I get it, but, but I would say um, we prioritize with exactly the order that the arrow, the arrow shows. Um, we don't want to go after um, quote unquote symptoms and things of that sort uh, too early on um, in, in, until we really got some momentum going and there's a reason to do it. Um, I think a lot of times um, treatment's going to be really hard because the, you know we've seen people in treatment team who's the goal is supposed to be that they're, they're dealing with some, one of the symptoms, and they don't see the purpose of it. They don't see, um, to quote um, somebody, I was in a meeting with a friend who's a peer, they said, um, what's in it for me? What's in it for me? And so I, so I think that that's, that's where you have to start. You have to start with the what's in it for me. Um, and, then, and then whatever the environmental barriers are, I mean, we, 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 I mean, when I think about barriers, um, we, we've applied this model in jail settings where, there's, where, where people have almost no freedom at all. But even in the context of not having a lot of freedom, there's still a lot that you can do to be developing um, the stuff that you want to be doing, given that context, and thinking about the future and, and how, what you're going to do and what, kind of, what you're doing now is linked up with that. One thing that I would add about the beliefs is that that is something that can be incorporated in at any point. Um, so, uh, and not so much a focus with the individual about, let's start thinking about how you think about things. Rather, it's... Uh, mixing in the medicine, it's mixing it into the activity. So if someone is really um, moving toward an aspiration or they have a helpful role in a milieu, those are all opportunities to draw attention to, um, you know, what it says about them or what, uh, or, or uh, you know, how connected they are and so forth. Um, uh, and even in those earlier stages where someone is particularly isolated or withdrawn, um, you can still draw some really meaningful beliefs work um, out of that. So. Um, drawing more attention to the fact that, wow, they're able to create um, some cool energy, that they were able to help you feel more energized, even if yeah. they don't think that they're more energized. Those types of things um, are the ways in which we, you know, even through all that, we can incorporate the beliefs work. Yeah, I think there might be a false dichotomy between uh, beliefs and behavior. Mm -hmm. um, we certainly wouldn't separate them. Um, we, need, we need stuff happening. We need activity. We need behavior, if you want to call it that, in order to work with beliefs. And we think they go together. And so we, we don't advocate working with the beliefs on their own. We work on them in the context of actual experiences that you're having. And, and the best thing is that they're happening right here, right now. 
Um, so some, some aspects of this, especially for people who have more severe negative symptoms, it's kind of like the flip side of an exposure therapy. What's happening is they're kind of becoming more and more active, and you're doing it right there, and then you're drawing conclusions about that and, and sort of basically bootstrapping them all the way up. Um, similarly, somebody who's really super agitated, um, all of that's about saying that, they, that actually after they belong to the group, they feel a lot better, and they, and they don't feel rejected by other people. And so, and, and they and they can get their needs met, and they don't have to, you know, do these things. So there's various ways in which the obstacles and come into it, but it's all sort of wrapped together, um, and it's really in service of the person driving the their own thing. Okay, and there were some people reflecting about how um, this um, compares, kind of like uh, with programs like wellness recovery action plans or motivational interviewing or solution-focused therapy. So I wonder what you have to say about, about that. Well, I, th I think that one of the things that, that we have certainly overlaps, this stuff has overlaps with all, all of those things. I think one of the things that we have um, is we, all, we, we, have, uh, we have a conceptual model which helps us understand how it is that people um, get stuck, but also how it is that they get better. Um, and we utilize the concept, that conceptual model. And so, so a lot of times when I've been talking with people who use some of these tools, they find that the, the conceptual model is very really helpful for them when they're working with somebody who won't let them in the door, um, when they're working with somebody else who, who won't talk to them, or when they're working with somebody who yells at them. Um, you know, it's not clear why they're yelling. I mean, I'm, again, I'm not saying these things pejoratively, um, but one of the things in our implementation work that we've really seen is the conceptual model. And that's actually why we have the recovery map. The recovery map lets us know what we need and how to put the stuff together. And, and we, so, so, so in some ways, I think our, our framework is you can sort of think it's sort of like, that's why it's Beckian, is that we've got, we've got sort of Be Beckian glue, if you will, that kind of puts it all together and does something, I think, um, very special with it that's particularly helpful, I think, for some of the more people who are really struggling. Just so for example, if um, we have somebody who um, feels really disempowered or very um, uh, devalued, um, having the understanding that they feel um, at their best or really want to feel important and valued and have a, maybe a helpful role, just as one example, uh, using that as a, our, our strategy, providing that uh, opportunity. Um, uh, can fit in really well to something like a, a rap plan. How are the, these, these things that I am putting down as helpful tools for me that I want to use when I'm feeling stressed related to how I actually want to, to feel? How does it connect to how I feel at my best? How does it connect to the things that I want? So it's really about under, having, when you have that understanding underneath, it makes it um, just very much more tangible and feel more useful that these things actually have a practical use in my day-to-day -day life rather than just being these are things that make me feel better temporarily, that it can be a, a broader connection made, I think, when you have that. Yeah. Noah kind of wonders what strategies you use to impact negative beliefs. I know you talked a lot about inspiring positive beliefs, but what anything specific you want to say about negative beliefs? Uh, I would say um, success experiences. That's actually what the paper I was describing before. I just, I just come to realize that, that um, I think I used, to, I used to think of it that the negative beliefs were largely what we were targeting with those success experiences, and I, and I, see, I see it differently now. Um, and so I was just trying to, maybe I'm overcorrecting, but, 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 it, but it really is about having, having the success experiences. But essentially, I mean, um, let me put it this way, um, there's, there's sort of, um, we think of it from, the, from, from this perspective that people have biases about, about what they can do, and what we're helping them these individuals have biases that keep them safe. Um, and so by seeing that, in fact, they can succeed um, and succeed at what they, they want and get the life that they want, that counters a lot of those negative beliefs. But I also think one of the ways in which that's really strengthened going forward is really when they walk around saying, you know, I, I'm a good person, or, or as somebody recently said to us, I kick ass. I mean, the real, the real emotional, positive sort of thing. And also when, when stuff gets rough, um, I, I, I know what to do. It might be hard at first, but I know, know some things to do, and that's a pretty powerful package. And Kathy asks if you've worked with individuals with Asperger's slash HFA and depression. It sounds like um, their social and introspection challenges are a huge barrier to accessing the adaptive mode. I was going to say, we worked. Yeah, we definitely have. Yeah. Um, no, we definitely have, and I think I think that actually the best way to 
the question. I'm not sure if we need the question one more time. But um, no, we definitely have, and I think that that the the focus on the individual and the individual interests are. You got them. <laughs> well, are, I, are gonna be, I mean, that's that's yeah. going to be unique, and it may not involve all the social interaction, but it may be other roles as well. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, and I don't think that we, we, we necessarily demand introspection. So right. so if it sounded like we were saying that, we don't actually. Thinking about thinking yeah, yeah. It, and that's why actually a lot of times the, the, the cognitive restructuring aspect of this is very casual. Um, and we, we certainly have worked with people who are in their 30s um, who, are, who, um, who have sort of very concrete cognitively. Um, and, and often uh, really easy, they really zone out when stuff gets to be just even a little bit abstract on them. Um, and, and then we found this is really concrete. It's really concrete and makes a lot of sense to them. Um, you know, um, basically, there's, there are certain things that are happening that will get them closer to or further away from the things that they want. Um, and, and I think we all can relate to that. And, and it's really kind of concrete. And I, th I think it, it really comes through. Um, so so it, is, it is an empirical question, I think, to, to what degree um, this model would or would not succeed um, across the, the spectrum there. But, but from what we've seen so far, um, we've had success. And again, I just really want to emphasize the idea that we're not really demanding a lot in terms of introspection. And it's, 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 it's a different, it's really an experiential um, approach. Yeah. Okay. Judy wonders if you're suggesting a reduction in the amount of time spent in problem-oriented group therapy. I, wouldn't, I would say, I think that was in the thinking about this idea of kind of clubs versus groups and that piece of it is when that came up. So I think that um, it's less about uh, reducing the time spent on it and more so making sure that when we're talking about the, the solutions and the, and the problems that it's really in the context of um, how but in being here it's actually going to be getting me closer to what I want. So for example if I um, I'm going to go to an anger management group because everyone tells me that I have anger management group at this time and that's what I'm supposed to do. Uh, I may not have that same kind of driver motivation or interest in really um, getting what I could out of the group. Um, or maybe I go and I do all the right stuff and then I walk out of the room and I still sock the next person I see. It, it, it has so much more powerful when we have that context of knowing what is a person's aspiration, what are the things they want, and how is how is it that, you know, maybe it'd be easier to get there if I um, have some better ways of talking to people. Um, that would be one way of thinking about it. So it's really not so much about lessening the time as it is really putting it into a helpful context, and that's where that kind of understanding of a person is going to be really important, that conceptualization. And I think some of our work with treatment teams is also trying to work work, work that part of it out. Um, you know, that, that it really, really coming from the person is something that they see that they need. I also think that the clubs can be organized also around people, some problems that people want to mm -hmm. uh, solve. Um, and that can be really empowering for people to help each other figure some stuff out so that they can, they can you know, and we've seen some of this. At, the, um, uh, at one of the facilities we worked at, it turned out that the, uh, the individuals were actually more clever than the staff in terms of figuring out how to get, uh, basically get approval for something that they really want to do, which actually happened to be, a drive to, to collect stuff for hurricane victims. And there was a bunch of state regulations they had to figure out and get around. So so, so I'm saying, I, I think it's maybe it's a false dichotomy. We like the concept of a club just because of what Ellen said. It's something you belong to. It's something you own. It's something you do with people. Um, and and maybe, maybe, unfortunately, groups have sort of become something that someone prescribes to you, tells it you that you need, and not, you don't always agree with it. Yeah. Um, I think Kate's happy you did talk about early intervention a bit, but she also asked, has it been integrated with IRT, the dominant individual therapy model in early intervention in the U.S., or integrated in the CBT for psychosis, and if so, how? Um, I, would, I would say that um, we've integrated it. Um, so CBT for psychosis is a little bit easier for, for me to, to initially tell you. Um, but we certainly, like I said, we've implemented it on, on the teams that are, that are in the community, and they're, they're putting out the, um, the, the RAISE model. So it's definitely, it fits, I think it fits pretty well within that. In terms of CBT for psychosis, um, the way I see CBT for psychosis is that it's more focused on uh, the positive symptoms, um, in particular hallucinations and delusions. Um, and so where, where it is that we pull from that is when somebody is having difficulty with those things and, and they, need, they need some skills to really be able to help them refocus back on the life that they want. But one of the things that we have learned, and this is with young people and it's also with older people, is not everybody needs that. 
not everybody needs that at all. We've met a lot of people that, that once they really start getting the life they want, their paranoia disappears and we don't see it anymore. So, so we, think, we think it's important that you throw a broader net onto that. Um, and I think the other thing I would say is that um, we have a much, uh, a lot more stuff for negative symptoms. So long story short, I think we really bring something very special um, to, the, to the first episode teams where we had been both um, Georgia and Pennsylvania and uh, also Virginia. Yeah. Um, Sarah is wondering, um, can you say more about how to move from aspirations to action in an outpatient setting? Sure. Um, I think there's a, a, a few ways we can do that. Um, so <clears throat> when we know what somebody wants, I mean, there's a really cool way that we can collaborate together um, each week to think about what should we be doing? What can we do while we're here? Are there things that an individual can help you with, for example, in terms of the way things are maybe set in your space? Can you go? Um, I, I know that sometimes uh, uh, in the outpatient setting where it can feel more restricted to, you know, an office and, and, and that way, but are there ways that we can actually move out into the, uh, you know, out of the office and into the community in some way to, to action the goals? Um, someone had actually commented an example that we have a, um, uh, there was an article that uh, Paul and other colleagues have published on for a, a woman who, as part of her individual weekly therapy session, that she um, brewed and served coffee to different people in the in the um, center here. Um, you know, so it's really about kind of being creative, and thinking outside the box of what is it that the, the meaning that the person is trying to achieve, and are there things that I can actually do here in, in each session to to action that. Um, and a lot of times I work with the, some young people who, uh, myself, who uh, it's about getting back to school and we're, you know, we're looking at things together. And what would my dorm look like? What would it, what would it be like? Um, and getting the energy to then start actually applying or asking for um, the next steps to do that. So that's just one, a couple of examples. Okay. Rhonda wonders, how do you overcome the challenge of inclusion in clubs and community and communities where people have been excluded intentionally due to stigma and prejudice? It's a great question. That's actually some of the stuff that we're um, we're working on at the moment. Um, but I but I would say just as, as sort of a philosophical um, position, um, you know, uh, as sometimes we sit down with people and say, well, sometimes other people suck, okay, and sometimes other people are going to treat you badly, and so that's where you build up the resiliency. Now that's not the only move, but I think it's a it's a good move to have because you can't control the reactions of other people. Um, but the other thing we're trying to do, and we're we're doing some projects in the community now with this. Um, is we also recognize that um, there's a real there's a real misunderstanding, obviously, between the community and the people who are living in the residential facilities in the community who, who might be stigmatized. And it's kind of similar to a lot of other things um, you might see in social psychology. When the people are doing activities together that bring out their common humanity, um, that 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 can change the whole thing. Um, you know, because the, the the community doesn't seem like these rejecting people who don't like you. Um, and, then, and then the people living in the home don't seem like they're these diagnostic, scary people, but, which they're not, of course, but they're actually, they seem like people just like you, because that's what they are. And so, so I think, I think there's, a, there's a couple of, of, of moves where, that we're exploring at the moment, um, but, I, but I do think that um, at the end of the day, helping people have, uh, have this kind of, of resiliency in regards to, well, you know, why do you think they would say those sorts of things? You know, what, what does that maybe say about them? Maybe they don't quite understand, you know, that kind of thing, as opposed to it wounding and, and, and hitting hard. But, but I, think, I think that um, there's a lot of work to be done in this area, but I, I think that the best possible thing we can be doing with it is, is really promoting as much community participation as possible, as opposed to participation that would happen uh, in, in, a, in sort of places where everyone has the same diagnosis, that kind of thing. Silo, yeah. Yeah, we, re we really believe that uh, the opposite. Opposite is what uh, is, is what's needed, and we think we think really think the community has a lot to learn, and we're really exploring that. Yeah, well, the questions uh, coming up about how people can learn more, like what texts are there, or when is your book coming out? How do people find out when your book comes out? Um, so you can say more about further learning. Sure, sure. So um, a couple things. Yeah, we do have a book coming out. Um, we're, we're being we're being very. Uh, very hard to get in terms of that. No, it's supposed to come out um, later this year, uh, later 2018. Um, and I guess if um, if uh, you wanted to provide us uh, with uh, your email address, we could we could let you know when it's getting closer. 
um, the publisher would certainly like that. Um, we, we're also, um, we're also, there's a workshop uh, on this perspective at the Beck Institute that is occurring um, in April, I believe. Uh, again, if, if you contact us, we can get you the dates. Um, we're doing a more extensive webinar through SAMHSA, uh, Alan and I, uh, in January uh, and February of 2018. So that's, an, that's another way. Uh, we can also send you a link to our website, which has some of the, some of the other tools. Um, and uh, you can also reach out to us directly. The, our website, the website has uh, all the different articles that have been published on this as well. Do people have a way to contact you? Should we put it in the chat box? Yeah, put it in the chat box. We're going to put it in the chat box. All right, sounds great. <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, by the way, I'm, we, we've gone an hour and a half. We could go a little longer if you want. I'm, I'm fine with that. Just want to do a time check. We're good. We're good. Okay. Um, so, can you talk a little more about progressing from accessing to energizing with people who seem uh, really not interested, like in this case, somebody who's afraid of leaving their cell in a prison? Um, somebody that, yeah, from access to energize, how to do that? Moving from accessing to energizing. Well, so I think that if we have somebody, hi, Mark and crew, by the way. Um, it's good to see. Good to know you guys are there. Um, I think that it's so. It's kind of two separate spots. So the person who doesn't want to leave their cell or leave their space or leave their room or leave their home, leave the, right. the right. place in the unit. Um, we're going to really have to focus on the access for for the most part. The energizing is going to be the piece that's going to come once we've really found out some of the ways in which uh, they're able to access that move. That, that mode um, and uh, try to incorporate it in kind of more routinely. So I want to kind of break that into two a little. So someone who really doesn't want to come out um, is really isolated and we're trying to find out what it is that um, ener that, that really gets that access to the energy. Uh, we, gotta, we can do a few different things. Now I know there's going to be some places where it's going to be a, a lot more challenging to say, you know, go in and start playing a song, for example. But um, going in and kind of asking opinions on, on different topics, uh, it's really, uh, you know, it can be one thing, but to do so frequently and fairly predictably is going to be one of the best ways to start kind of breaking people out. Because I think one of the things that we see is that folks are so quick to um, reject the attempt at connection that many people, many staff will provide. So coming in to see how things are going or to talk with them and being met with um, maybe no or um, I'm good, I'm good those kinds of things, um, sets up a, a situation where a lot of times people will eventually maybe stop coming because they don't think they're going to get a response from the individual. And that actually then tends to set in this uh, um, expectation the individual has that people don't actually care and so forth. So I really encourage a lot of kind of persistence and uh, frequency in popping in. But one of the things that we often say is, you know, not going in and asking people how they're doing at the outset because how do we think we're doing? They're feeling pretty crummy. Um, or just really disconnected. Um, so not really going in with, with those questions and more so going in with a kind of a target, something you're really trying to, to, to aim for. You know, hey, did you catch the Eagles game um, the other night? Did you hear about Wentz and Knee or ACL? Oh, my gosh. What are we going to do? Um, kind of jumping in with a topic and seeing if it hits, seeing if it hits, because they're not all going to. Um, but usually when in, in those attempts, it, it, it happens more frequently. Once we find something that hits, we can move more into the energizing by more, like by kind of growing in that topic with a person. So um, let's say that it's, it's football that hit. Um, maybe it's talking about stats. Maybe it's asking for help on your own fantasy football team, who to put in or take out. Um, whatever the topic uh, or area might be, it's kind of providing multiple opportunities in which to do it. And then um, encouraging, you know, when, if you see someone's energy actually increasing or you're seeing that they are, um, you know, maybe we've gone from the blanket over the head to the, the head out, um, finding a way to, to do that same activity together on a milieu. Yeah, no, I think we've been kind of amazed. Like, there's the, there's the guy that uh, turned out it was Indian food, of all things. He, he wasn't coming out of his room. He wasn't talking to anyone. Um, and then it turned out that he was really interested in Indian food. That was the one thing that hit. 
Um, and so then they began growing, talking about Indian food. Nobody really knew who she was talking to, anything about Indian food. So he was immediately the expert in Indian food. And so the staff thought it was like a, like, it was like a miracle. This is a guy who wouldn't talk to anyone. He was, he was, not, he was not interacting at all. And all of a sudden, you get him talking about Indian food. Um, he was so animated and he was so, uh, so different. So, so that's what we think. It's, it's, it's not a matter of that the, the people can't. It's about trying to figure out, you know, finding, finding it, basically not, never giving up. That's what we would say, never giving up. And it's not going to be obvious always what it is. Um, uh, we, we've worked with people who um, were completely afraid to leave a hospital and were there for a couple of decades. Um, and then there's a whole process for finding out what they're interested in, ultimately connecting up to their values in some sense, and, and then slowly seeing how that might happen in the community. Not trying to coerce them anywhere, but just kind of drawing them out. Um, and then ultimately they, they can leave the hospital. And so something could be similar for, for somebody who's afraid of leaving their house. Um, okay. I think it's one of the tools that we sometimes use, just real quick, uh, one of the tools that we could use if somebody's really found something that is a good hook for them, getting them to kind of plan that into their day. So that would be like the um, uh, activity scheduling or positive action scheduling, kind of finding a way, hey, we enjoyed this now, when, and some other times we can do things. Um, but that's, I think, further along once we really know what it is and they've gotten a chance to do it several times. It's not something that we can start with. Yeah. So Sarah wonders how you'd work on actualization in a group outpatient setting. Yeah. I think that the group, uh, this we've really, uh, I think, done a cool job of incorporating this into groups. It can be a really great way to connect people around things that even if they don't have the same aspiration, a lot of the meanings that we have met are the same. So um, there's been a really, and actually, I'm going to, I feel like you should show us on this a little bit, the positive action kind of swoop in. Uh, I'm swooping Francesca in. Um, <clears throat> so we do, because we do a lot of groups um, around this. But the formula is really similar. So uh, in a group, we want to find a way to kind of get everyone activated and into that adaptive mode. So it might be we listen to music together. Maybe we toss a ball around as we're talking. There's a front, bunch of ways. But we, our mission is really to identify what are some of the uh, things that people really want in the future and how is it that, uh, and, and what are those meanings that people can really relate to and want to kind of help each other uh, problem solve how to figure out. Um, so, uh, and also keeping everyone's interest involved, because I think one of the tricky things that happens in groups is that if you kind of just go around and ask each person what they like or what they want, by the time you get to the last person, everyone's either kind of just checked out, um, maybe kind of involved in something else or, or asleep or, you know, uh, it's harder to pull everyone together. So we really kind of are all about doing a very active um, and kind of dynamic approach to really pulling people together. But um, once people are really activated, it's about, as a whole group, thinking about what do the people want? What do we, at the end of the day, you know, um, what, do you, what do you want to be getting and doing that maybe you're not, or things that you haven't thought about in a while that you'd like to be getting back to, and really getting that from a lot of people, um, and asking each other, uh, connecting each other up to the things that um, they might have in common and didn't realize. Hey, it sounds like you want to be a nurse, you really want to help people, and hey, you said that you wanted to work in that jewelry store so that you could really uh, help a lot of people and make them happy too. How cool is that? I don't know if you want to add to about the group. Yeah, and I think um, I work in a lot of residential programs, uh, so this works particularly well there, although I don't see why it couldn't necessarily work in an outpatient. Mm -hmm. um, but also, that type of group lends itself really well to like Ellen was saying, connecting over a bunch of shared interests. And that's not something that necessarily has to stop at the end of the group. Um, and so what we often find is that through that connection, we can actually see that um, like people follow up on that and do and help each other out in those areas throughout the rest of the week and move it into action throughout the rest of the week as well. Yeah. So even if there are opportunities to... Um, uh, if there aren't opportunities to maybe do things as a group, though I think if we're really creative, there's always something we can be doing to move people closer to their goals in the context of a group. Um, but it's also about how we uh, set an action plan throughout the course of the week in between groups that is going to really uh, tap into the meaning. You know, what's something that you know we can all do this week to, we all sound like a lot of us really want to help people. What's one way that we might be able to try that out this week? Things along those lines. It works okay. for me. Yeah. Um, Iris shared a little her story about how, how she was helped and offered her contact information. Uh, Deborah's saying you referenced a journal article that you've done. Can you please advise further or say a little more about that? Yeah, I want to put the, um, 
going to try and put the link to the resource page in the chat box. I just want to make sure that I get it you can right. Find it. Yeah, I'll try to grab it. Um, yeah, there's uh, there's many articles. Uh, the one in particular I think I referenced was the case study. Um, one of the case studies. Okay. So um, we will. We may have to. I just don't want to get the link wrong. Um, Actually, you know what, Ailita, you're on the call. Can one of you guys type in our resource page website? That's awesome. We have some team members who are watching in, and <laughs> that would be helpful. <laughs> I, I have a question. Um, what about, let's say, somebody, their, as, their aspirations they're mostly talking about seem really fantastical. Um, yeah. You know, like somebody wants to, I think one of they wanted to, um, Figure, figure out how to get money from everyone else's bank accounts. Um, yeah. This isn't actually that fantastical, but it was it was sort of <laughs> like by, by studying prime numbers and, and somehow, you know, it's just stuff that's sure. kind of like way out there. Yeah. I think um, often in those cases, and, and we hear those situations come up quite often, um, you know, I think one of the approaches that we often try to take is to try and get an understanding of what the meaning is behind that, um, to try and get a sense of, of what is it about that aspiration that, that is important to that person or is meaningful? Asking them, you know, um, if you were able to do this, um, and I'm sorry, I didn't get the exact example, but if you were able to get, my, get the money from accounts. people's bank accounts, you know, what would be good about that? What would you be able to do? Uh, who would you be doing it with? Um, and it's really interesting because oftentimes those questions really um, lead to some, some just very common basic desires that people have. Uh, you know, it might be that I'm hoping that I can get money so that I can, you know, take care of the people around me. Or, um, you know, I want to make sure that I always feel safe and secure. Uh, and, and when we are able to sort of tap into some of those underlying needs, those underlying um, desires, that's also something that we can collaborate with individuals around. Uh, because oftentimes that's actually the thing that's, that's the most motivating. So talking to people about, you know, if it is about helping people, it sounds like that's something that's really important to you. I wonder if we could think about how you how you want to go about doing that. Yeah, I think I think one of the really interesting things is that uh, <laughs> that oftentimes what sound like really um, amazing and almost unbelievable um, sort of aspirations that people have often can be met by very very um, concrete experiences that don't seem to be so 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 big. So, so somebody who might be, um, who might think that they own the state or the hospital, that kind of thing, ends up being really happy if they could help animals. Um, and, it, and so it's, it's really an interesting sort of thing. I think it's more about the need level um, and what the thing is, what it's standing for. So we often think of delusions in particular when we run into them as ways to understand what's, what's valuable to the person. Is it that they want to feel safe or is it that they want to feel important or connect, whatever it is. And then once they're able to do that, then those beliefs aren't nearly so, uh, don't have so much, uh, uh, comp aren't so compelling for them. Just so people know, uh, one of our amazing team members, Nina, just typed the resource page uh, for our, uh, our work uh, in the chat box. Um, I was going to do that, I just didn't want to get it wrong. So I, thank you, Nina, for, for posting that. Um, but that's where you'll be able to um, access the um, the different articles on the model itself, the clinical trial, and so forth, as well as the different um, research on implementation. Great. So yeah. Sarah says she, she works as a social worker in a high school and wonders if you have any advice on how best to engage high school students who are dealing with anxiety, depression, and lack of motivation, in particular in places where the climate is overstimulating and they're often on kind of high alert. Sure. I think um, I would say that uh, trying to connect over those things that uh, you all may have in common outside of those challenges would be a really uh, important way. Talking about just kind of the things that are really important to them are always going to be really an important uh, mechanism for connecting. And I think in high school, it's one of those times where everyone's asking you, like, what do you want to be when you grow up? Or like, you know, what do you want to be in the next little bit of time? And that could be really overwhelming in and of itself. But uh, it's also a really good time to start imagining. And, and you know, none of us have, um, well, most of us, I don't think, have just like one set thing that we're interested in or one set thing that we want to do in our future. We have really diverse, um, you know, aspirations and so forth. And so really getting the, them to think about kind of that and, 
very broad way that it's not that they have to make a, a decision tomorrow, right? They have to, but, but we want to start thinking about what it might be like. Um, I also, when I read that question, I think about roles as well, um, and particularly when you think about like um, a place that has a lot of activity and feels really overwhelming. How do I fit in? How do I have a sense of belonging? How do I have a sense of being able to achieve things in kind of that environment? And um, so I think if there's opportunities to um, to identify roles either socially uh, in the context of school or you know on a broad, on a smaller scale things that feel more comfortable that can be really helpful. Yeah, I would just want to illustrate sort of be, being mindful of the, the role that disconnection can really play yeah. in I think uh, fostering a lot of the problems that the younger people have. And so what Ellen's talking about I think is really trying to help help them be connected and, and draw the meaning that, that they can be a part of something. Um, there's some stuff that matters, and, and it's when they withdraw that you're going to see a lot of the, the other stuff come up. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we've oh. kind of gotten through the questions, and you guys have done an amazing job, and lots of people have expressed their thanks, and um, really we're, I think, all looking forward to learning more about this and putting it into practice. As someone said, there's a, a lot to to do <laughs> to <laughs> yes, we're feeling make that. it happen. And to do that culture change, too. I love it that you included that piece. I think that's so important. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. We, we, we agree. Well, we thank you for the opportunity yeah. and for all of the great questions and the participation. Thanks um, so much. Yeah, yeah, thank you all so much. Yeah. OK, so I guess we'll end it. But I'll, I'll leave the chat box open in case somebody has a few more things that you want to say. But yeah. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.